What's up? It's Simone Show here with another session of Get Schooled. Are you ready for today's pop quiz? Okay, here we go. What are some of the applications driving the 3G evolution? Is it A, binary code is just so yesterday, B, the demand for connectivity to information and people, or C, the new web concert hosted by Kenny G and his background singers? Get it? 3G? <laughs> Don't know the answer? Don't worry, sit back and relax. It's time to get schooled. Hi, I'm Dave Morphus with Tell Ads, and today I'm here with Chris Everts, and we are going to talk about 3G evolution. Are these sort of uh, evolutionary steps that have to take place one after the other? Are, are carriers going to jump from one to the other as they come out? I mean, is, is, it, is it a, you know, a complete uh, linear thing, or is it adoption as they see necessary for their applications? I think it's going to be more the latter of that, the adoption as they see necessary for applications. What we've seen in the industry is there have been times where steps have been skipped um, going forward. So it's not necessarily a sequential, mm -hmm. you know, lockstep evolution. It takes time to develop these standards and to get the standards out. One example, I think, is UMTS. You had release 99, then you had release 4, mm -hmm. you have release 5, now there's release 6 and release 7. It costs a lot of money to deploy these technologies. What you tend to see is the carriers, the folks who have to build these networks, have a business case they have to justify. They have to find the economic model that will work for them. Mm -hmm. When they're looking for that economic model, they have to figure out, well, how much bandwidth am I going to deploy? How many subscribers am I going to have to support for each cell site? Things like that. They can't necessarily afford to buy every single generation of the standards that came right. out. And so what you'll see is, um, maybe they'll take a partial step in a technology. I think you can find EVDO. They didn't spend much time in, in the release zero of EVDO. They mostly went straight to Rev A. Okay. A couple of networks did do small deployments of EVDO, but Rev A came along. It was really the, the solution that was going to give them the bandwidth that they needed. So they started with Rev zero or release zero, but they didn't spend much time on it. They pretty much went straight to Rev A. I think in North America, you could make the same case for UMTS, where they really went to a release four, almost release five type of deployment architecture for their first deployment of UMTS. They really completely skipped release 99. So I think that sort of begs the question, will they actually do every single release of UMTS? Will they really do Rev B, Rev C? And it's a timing thing and a market demand. You know, what do they have to do to compete with each other? You know, do the UMTS carriers have to get to release six in order to compete with Rev A for UMTS? Mm -hmm. there, there's questions like that. I, I don't know the exact answer of what all those, which releases will be adopted and which ones will be skipped. HSDPA is a good example of that. HSDPA wasn't really defined in release four. They're really deploying a release four network with HSDPA in it okay. because they need that high speed download. Does that mean they'll go straight to release five or will they wait for release six before they go to the next step? Because Every release they deploy is a major investment for them. So they have to figure out where do we get the, the economic benefit. One of the things that we talked about was uh, in the network, there's quite a bit of cost associated with the backhaul piece of the network. Um, there's plenty of information out there that suggests that it's a quarter of total OPEX for a wireless operator. So what are operators doing and or what is Telabs doing to help operators optimize that cost? Sure, that is a, a huge issue for wireless carriers. And it's really a, an issue of scale. The reason that carriers have such a huge percentage of their operating costs going towards these backhaul networks is because they have so many cell sites, because they have such a large population to cover. Um, in North America, and even in um, some of the European countries, I know that the number of cell sites that they're supporting ranges from 20,000 cell sites up to 50,000 plus cell sites. Whenever you start doing the mathematics behind that and say, okay, I have to deliver three megabits of bandwidth to a cell site, and it's going to cost me, you know, $200 a month, $600 a month to deliver that bandwidth to that cell site, then you have to multiply that number by 50,000 sure. times, times 12 months, and all of a sudden you go, wow, that is a huge number. One of the areas that we've spoken about is Ethernet. Ethernet is really a technology that lowers the cost 
of large amounts of bandwidth to transport. So it moves away from T1s towards Ethernet. Ethernet allows these carriers to get 10 megabits out to a cell site on a single pipe. Mm -hmm. It also allows them to expand that bandwidth essentially via software configuration rather than having to add another T1 and another T1. Another area where Telabs is working with carriers is in re-architecting that backhaul network. Now that we're really moving to a more data-centric architecture, we can actually put aggregation points further out into the network to collect traffic closer to the cell sites. And when we aggregate that traffic, we can share bandwidth between different cell sites. And that sharing of bandwidth actually helps the carriers lower their costs mm -hmm. to deliver that transport. So that's an area where Telabs is doing a lot of work with customers, really at evolving this network from a TDM architecture to a true packet architecture, leveraging um, strengths like Ethernet. I think in the end then, the only constant that we see, whether it's uh, LTE or whatever technology is behind it, however these networks evolve, uh, there is going to be change, there is going to be evolution, there are going to be applications, some that we know, some that we don't know at this point, uh, that are going to change these networks. Well, that's a great point. Change is definitely occurring in the wireless networks. You could say that the internet was invented 30, 40 years ago, but it really went through a huge explosive growth phase in the 90s. I think we're seeing the same thing come to wireless networks now, where that data technology is really starting to hit the speeds that's going to make the adoption rate go up, mm -hmm. and the network's going to fundamentally have to change because of this influx of bandwidth that's going to have to be supported. So there is a large change going on. We're going to be going through it. It's an exciting time in wireless networks. That wasn't too hard, was it? The correct answer was B, the demand for connectivity to information and people. Like a neighborhood block party without the chips and dip? If you missed the answer, your homework is to download the cheat sheet at inspirethenewlife.com. Come on back tomorrow for another pop quiz and maybe a little Kenny G.